Good morning. Good morning. I have to admit that this is not my favorite place to be, and I am a little nervous and anxious to be up here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, when coming up with what I should talk about for this week, when me and Harold were having a conversation probably a month and a half ago, this was not the topic. Um, honestly, I forget what the topic was. It's one of those things we went down rabbit trail after rabbit trail and we ended up somewhere else and it was a fun little conversation. But as I got closer, I figured uh, the best thing to do would be to find a passage and see what I can't pull from it. And the passage, this, in the, uh, what is it, the litany or the lectionary. lectionary, thank you, was this one. And it seemed a little weird. This is the week of joy. That's what the candle's supposed to represent. But this passage doesn't seem to talk much about joy. So, why should I pick this? Because I think there's something else here that I would like to get at. Um, and I want to thank Caleb. You did a phenomenal job covering it this morning. I, and I want to go a little bit farther in depth with it. And what I wanted to talk about is suffering. Suffering is part of the journey of life, and it's something that we really don't want to think about or deal with or talk about. It's uncomfortable. It hurts. It's painful. But we all have to go through it, whether we're Christian or not. And I think that one of the best reasons why we should focus uh, on suffering at this point is that the reality of the situation is adversities do not make a person weak. They reveal the strength that we have. It is also something that throughout our history, we talk about our stories. Our stories oftentimes center around pain. We talk about many different forms of that. It's also something that is celebrated throughout the Bible. Philippians 1.29 says, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but to also suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now, and now hear that I still have. Philippians uh, 3.7 But whatever gains to me now, consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowledge, Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost everything. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, know the power of the resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining the, to the resurrection from the dead. Suffering is something we have to go through in all aspects of life. And it's one of those things that... Uh, if you look back through, again, history, the Bible mentions it multiple times. One of the best known accounts is Job. Everything that Job went through, he lost his entire family. He lost everything he had. He was physically in, ill and broken down. Moses suffered greatly. He was kicked out from being one of the princes of Egypt and lived in the wilderness as a goat herder. And then came back and was ostracized by his own people, shunned for running away, and then led them out of the promised land. Samson was eventually captured, put in slavery, and chained to pillars, and he ended up dying. Almost every prophet ended up suffering in some form. David, we've been talking about, suffered under Saul and then became king and then suffered under his own son, Absalom. 
the Israelites were kicked out of their own homes. All the apostles, except for John, ended up dying. And they said in Acts 5.41, when the apostles left the Sanhedrin, this is when they were still in Jerusalem, uh, ministering and healing, uh, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they accounted themselves worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. And then I brought this big old book, which I'm not going to read from, but many of you know. It's The Martyr's Mirror. We all undergo suffering. It seems that though those who are children of God and chosen by God undergo a lot of suffering, you've heard of the thought of going, undergoing through the crucible to find refined gold. We talk about that. So why am I talking about this on the week of joy? I'm going to do a little hop, and you're going to have to bear with me a little bit because my mind oftentimes goes a couple different places at once. Um, there is a saying that has been popularized uh, by a gentleman by the name of jo Jocko Willink, and that is, discipline equals freedom. People who have disciplined lives, who have a regulated schedule, they end up finding time for doing other things, or they can accomplish the tasks that they want. I remember when I was very lost and scattered. I didn't really have a career or a path to go. I ended up reading his book on it and started to uh, try to discipline and regiment my life and turn things around a good deal. Uh, much like Discipline equals freedom. Suffering equals joy. I know this seems a little backwards and a little crazy. You're going to have to bear with me. We'll get there. It seems counterintuitive, kind of like discipline equaling freedom. So let's, let's hop to a couple examples. Because obviously suffering is, exam or you can see it in the bad things in life, but what about the good things? What about having kids? Not everybody can get pregnant. Some people struggle for a long time. And when they do get pregnant, they have to give birth. And I've been told that's not a pleasant experience. I don't know anything about it, but... But then you're a parent and you have kids. That's a journey. What about being a teacher? One of the hardest things that I've learned in my past time teaching and now that I'm currently teaching is you don't always see the end result. Are you doing a good enough job as a teacher? Are you connecting with that kid? Maybe that kid doesn't care. Maybe they do. Maybe something in their life outside of school is going on that you have no control over and you just have to hope that you're giving them the best chance possible. Let's go back to parenting. Do you know you're going to be a good parent? What about the decisions you have to make when it comes to disciplining, punishing, the things that you teach your kids? How do you know that they're the right thing? The hours you spend up at night because not always does the, do the kids sleep through the night. I know that my nieces never did and I slept in the car when Seth and Chrissy were home because I got a full night's sleep and it was winter. <laughs> right? There's a lot of sacrifice with being a parent. In the text they talk about being a farmer. Farmers take a huge gamble. They put most of their finances and resources in the ground in hopes that come harvest, they're going to have something. They work year-round, fertilizing, watering, planting, in order to hope for a good harvest. What about if you're working on getting better, doing better in your career, getting an education? If you're in high school, studying, or not, I know I didn't always do that, college what about in trade school you got to put hours in and sometimes it's outside of work on top of that what about OTJ on the job training and all the mistakes that come from that one 
How do you know it's going to pay off? The song that comes to mind probably the most in this regard is the song, there's a, what is it? In the bulb, there's a flower. What does the flower look like, though? And to get to that point, So let's hop back to joy, right? Uh, I think one of the reasons why when I say suffering equals joy, there's a little bit of a pullback and a little bit of tension, at least in myself, and that's because the confusion between joy and happiness. They're not the same. What is joy? Where does it come from? How long does it last for? Is it something you can have in the middle of hardship? What about happiness? How long does that last for? Where do I find that? What are the things that make me happy? To me, it seems like happiness is an exterior. Meanwhile, joy comes from the inside. In many ways, joy comes from God. I think that's why it's one of the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits come from the Spirit. They come from God. Meanwhile, happiness is pleasant, lovely, short-term. Kind of like a drug almost. So let's look back at those previous examples that I mentioned. <clears throat> because with reaching that next level, reaching the joy in it, more often than not that we have to go through the patience and the perseverance to get to the end result. Let's go to the farmer. Again, the farmer analogy was used because it was a very physical and understood thing back then. And I think in this community, it's also very well understood. When that harvest comes, and it's been a good harvest, you know that you're financially secure for the next year. You feel content. You feel happy. But you also see the beauty of the plants that have grown from it. You see the calves grow into full-blown cows and steers. For parents, it's kind of only, at least for me in my perspective, it's only when you see the child fully grown that you understand that you made the right choices. I remember having conversations with my dad. Uh, we do it often, but when we would, every now and again, he'd start apologizing. Because he felt like he made mistakes or let me down. It'd usually be about something in my past. Uh, whether it was the hardships that I went through in Florida growing up, and he should have tried to protect me or shield me from it more. Or it would be something along the lines that he didn't think he made the right call on disciplining me in some regard. He should have been uh, more strict, or he should have taught me this instead. And all I can say to him is, that's, you don't need to apologize. Because at the end of the day, it wasn't the choices you made, it was the hardships I went through that made me who I am. And I thank you for that. Teachers. Again, it's only when the students come back after they've graduated, you can see where they've ended up, that they've made themselves into something, that you truly can appreciate the work that you've done. I remember when I went back to Central Christian and I saw Tim Shu after I graduated and I was in college, and I said hi to him, I was talking with him, I said, you know, Tim, thank you. Thank you for forcing me to sing. I do not like being in front of people. I still don't like being in front of people. But it was one of the things that helped build confidence in myself, that I am capable, that I am able to stand in front of people, and I am able to talk in front of people. And you helped get me there. Thank you. He teared up a little bit. And I like to think he was having a good day then. But I don't know. It's only when you get to where you want to go in your career that you appreciate the education and the long nights and the hours you stayed awake writing papers that you despised writing that you understand.
understand you know this was the right call i made the right path i went the right direction it's not in the middle i can guarantee you those all nighters i pulled to write papers for chemistry no i don't i don't care about those nights in the moment but now i recognize you know the discipline to stay awake to focus those are the things i learned from that i know generally as a, a Mennonite and a pacifist group, we don't like getting into the military, and that's kind of a thing we stay away from. But I have a number of friends who are, who are military, and either active or uh, post, and talking with them, their perspectives on suffering. Without suffering, you will not become a stronger person. With suffering comes fatigue, mistakes, and failure. The more you can artificially create that suffering, the better you are prepared for when true suffering comes. Three, the best memories will be created as lesson and or, m the best memories will be created and lessons that are remembered during those times are the best ones. Four, bonds are best created during suffering. Long walks, wet nights in foxholes, Carrying a third of your body weight, running and operating on little food and calories and sleep with men who endure the same thing and push you forward. Becoming, uh, become those that deeply, those become the deep, ones you deeply respect and care about. Suffering show, uh, weeds out the weak and shows who you can trust. It teaches you how far you can push yourself and make you physically and mentally stronger. Suffering is one of those things that we don't like to acknowledge because it's hard. We don't like to think about because it's hard, but it is one of those things that challenges to us to grow in ways that we never thought about previously. It's one of those things, as the old saying goes, when one prays for an attribute, seldom do they get it. They just get the chance to practice it. So let's jump to the Christmas story. How does this fit in with the Christmas story? In this week of joy, let's put all the pieces together that I've sporadically thrown at you like a dodgeball event in high school. Um, one of my things my dad taught me was always begin with the end in mind. So let's begin with the end in mind. This is the beginning. The end is when Christ was crucified, was raised from the dead, paid the price for our sins. He conquered the grave for us, for you. Ultimately, the birth of Christ is the starting period of, one of, the, of a great suffering for God, culminating in the Easter story. It is when Christ voluntarily stepped into the world for us. He forced himself in here knowing full well what was going to happen to him. Full well. I didn't know what was going to happen to me this past week. I would have had a nice little slide with a bunch of pictures and this would be a lot more organized and less sporadic. But my brakes blew out Monday night on the way home from work. Because of all the work I've been doing, I got taken out on Tuesday with a exhaustion sickness. Wednesday, I went back to work. I worked 17 and a half hours because there was a random uh, what pulse that came across the main lines that blew out a couple of the PLCs, and we had to spend that long re or fixing the factory. I got two and a half hours of sleep, woke back up, drive, drove my car to the shop, walked a mile and a half to get picked up for work, went to work, worked nine hours. Went home, well, met with Harold, which was a lovely time. Turned right around, went back to work the next day for another nine hours. If I had known what I was getting into this past week, I would have just said, hey, Harold, nope, 
you're doing it. I'm not, I'm going on vacation. I, I would have. That's honestly what I'd do. But God knew everything he was getting himself into. He knew what Christ would suffer through, and he still chose it for us. Secondly, he used his strength to stay here. He could have left. He was offered opportunities to get out. He was tempted by Satan in the desert. There are multiple times when the apostles would say, hey, there's another way, right? He chose to stay. He fought to stay. And lastly, he ignored the people in his life that were trying to get him to do another way of, of acting. Peter tried to convince him. The apostles tried to convince him not to go to Jerusalem. Peter had a sword ready at Gethsemane. There was another way. He chose to ignore them. <clears throat> the suffering that Christ went through was payment for us. God's joy. We are his joy. And he wants us to share that joy. So, this is the week of, the, of joy, and during it, we should remember that we will suffer because he suffered for us. He loves us that much, and he wants us to grow to be like him and to join him. So, a couple of questions for you. When was the last time you suffered? What was it like? Was it a week ago? A month? A year? What did you learn from it? How did you grow? Was it worth it? Have you not, or do you not see it yet? Did you gain from it? Or did someone else? Remember that joy is from God and that hardships are for our growth. Sometimes the things that we sometimes there are things that we learn from it. Sometimes it's for others and their benefit. And sometimes it's just so that we can get closer to God. The one who loves us and has known us forever. So, as we go forward, let us stand tall, square our shoulders, own our mistakes. and push forward knowing that Christ walks alongside us and with us.